Hello everyone, Kent Bressler here. I want to welcome you to Kent's Kidney Stories. During our time together um, over these podcasts, I'd like to uh, discuss kidney disease. I'd like to tell you about my journey as a transplant patient, but also talk about dialysis, kidney donation, and just about anything else that might be of interest. Kent's Kidney Stories podcast endorsed and sponsored by kidneysolutions.org. Good morning, everybody. It's morning where I am. I don't know if you're listening to this, what time it is for you, but uh, we have a beautiful morning in Texas. And uh, I'm looking forward today to talking with Tony Martin and uh, so let's get started. It's going to be a kidney anniversary, and uh, let's get started with prayer this morning. Heavenly Father, we ask for your forgiveness and pray that you will guide us today in all of our endeavors. And we seek your precious love just to sustain us. In your holy name we ask this. Amen. Tony. Good morning. How are you? Good morning. How are you? <laughs> I'm doing <laughs> fine. We do these, uh, I call them kidney bursaries, and that's what everybody calls them, but a kidney anniversary. So uh, I'm glad to have you on this morning. I've never met you, and I'm going to gain a new friend here. And in general, I like gaining new friends. Yeah. So, <laughs> so tell me tell me a little, little bit about your story, about your kidney journey. Um, my first year in college at 18, um, I had a study for my midterms and I took some no dos and thought, thought it was safe with like coffee. And then the next three days I was vomiting, couldn't keep anything down. But since it was around November, I thought it was the flu. So I went to the emergency room and the doctor told me I was in having kidney disease. And that's how I first found out I had kidney disease. Were you in, in full failure at that time or were you, you know? No, the blood pressure was high and some of the BUN and um, creatinine was a little elevated. But other than that, um, not full. Not uh, full blown. Okay. Blood, yeah. Yeah. So did then you, they did. Go ahead. Yeah. Did they, they encourage you to see a nephrologist or go back to your and, regular doctor? How did they handle that? They referred me back to a pediatric nephrologist. Oh, how old were you at the time? 18. 18, okay. And they did a bunch of testing, like um, an IVP, and found that I had reflux nephropathy, where the urine doesn't stay in the bladder. It goes back in the kidneys. Oh, oh, oh. Kills oh. the nephrons. Yeah, yeah. And they were shocked to find out I had 50% kidney loss in both kidneys at age 18. So <laughs> the luck of the draw, I guess you would call that. I mean, it, you don't it had nothing to do as a mechanic thing, a manic, mechanical issue. So how did then, you, how did you, uh, how did you fare after that? You go to the doctor frequently or um, that, that December during my college break, they admitted me to the hospital. Okay put me in to realign the ureters from the kidneys to the bladder to stop the reflux. And when the urologist did the surgery, he planned on an hour surgery. He had to call in a backup surgeon. It turned into be four hour surgery Aye. because there was so many holes in the ureters. They were shocked. I hadn't been septic. Yeah. So you hadn't picked it up and gotten, gotten out in your abdomen too. Wow. That's right. uh, that's, that's pretty gr graphic. Uh, you could think about having that, living with that for 18 years. You don't really know when it started. But at 18, to face that, uh, it's tough. There was tough. a big challenge because oh, everybody yeah. said, you're young, you can do whatever, go to school, you know, see the world, all that. And I'm being told I'm going to have to look into learn about dialysis and transplant and you know, prepare my will and things like that. It was pretty scary at 18. 
get your house in order at 18. Uh, <laughs> yeah. You don't even have a house. <laughs> no, I don't have anything. What do, what do I will? My, my, you know, stuff. Your scooter from and your bike. and. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. So, so at 18, you're still going to school. When did this, uh, when did this turn and go south on you when you started to have problems with your kidneys uh, um, failing maybe? Well, they had told me to hurry up and get my degree, get married and have a kid <laughs> running out at 18, yeah. no pressure, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so it's probably um, my young twenties. I did get my degree and I did start working and get married. And then um, they told me I could have one healthy pregnancy and I had a lot of miscarriages and uh -huh. then I ended up with identical twin daughters. So the kidney doctor was not happy. He said, I, I, I said one, not two. And I said, don't <laughs> believe in miracles. <laughs> the, the twins are here for a reason and um, they're a blessing. So long story short, um, I went into toxemia and preeclampsia. Sure. So they had to take the babies early and they were um, what's called growth, inner, inner uterine growth retarded. So they were smaller than what they should have been for gestational age. So they let, they both weighed less than a pound each. Oh my. I lived three days. She died of a pulmonary hemorrhage and Brittany lived two weeks and she died of a brain hemorrhage. And then they told me I couldn't have any more kids because it'd be like Russian roulette. Yes. Yes. Yeah. I got pregnant six months later. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. I said, God, God has a plan. <laughs> You just have to follow me. I don't know. God wants this child. So my child is Ashley and she is um, now um, 25. So she just graduated from college and um, she's been a true blessing, but she was a preemie as well. Oh, okay. So, but she, she weigh a little bit more. Yeah. She was called a fat preemie. They called it. Yeah. Cause I went into gestational diabetes. So she was, she was like two pounds on ultrasound and within a week um, before birth, she grew to seven pounds, 11 ounces. At, wow. At, so yeah, they, she was still NICU for a while. I, I, I laugh about this. It's not, it's not funny, but I can tell you when people go through this kidney disease, there are things that you just, you know, you live with. Don't yeah. get pregnant when you do so what? You know, yeah. you're going to live your life, but you can't, you, they want you to do things, but you're not always able to do that. Okay. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then after that, um, a couple years later, when she was about five years old, that's when my mom died of cancer. And then, um, I ended up starting peritoneal dialysis. Okay. How long were you on dialysis? Well, peritoneal was only a year because every time I would do the exchange and do the drainage, um, every once in a while it would be bloody, so we'd have to call the ambulance. And I was working full time for a pharmaceutical company at the time. So she got to know, my daughter got to know the paramedics and the firemen very well. Um, <laughs> my first name? <laughs> that was... That was a, a learning curve for her. She started learning how to do a report when the ambulance guy got there. She'd be like, she's a 29-year-old single female Caucasian with history of hypertension, reflux, nephropathy. I mean, the kid just picked it up like crazy. And so I told her, I said, growing up, you can be anything you want. You don't have to go into medicine, but she is going into medicine. So <laughs> is she going to be a doctor? She wants to be a doctor. Um, she's already shadowed in our pediatric hospital nearby um, kidney transplants. And she is, she just had tears in her eyes when the a patient got a kidney and they undid the clamps and the urine just started flowing on the operator. Yeah, yeah, I bet. She, well, that's that's great. I'm had I'm happy for her and then happy for you too. It's it's yeah, amazing so, what life brings with that. Yeah, yeah. So a lot so, of joy with her. Yeah, absolutely. And that you know you had the uh, unfortunate ha happen to you with the loss of the two, but like you yeah. said, God God's in this. I mean, no matter how you you, you look at it, it's always got I the realized, spin on it. Yeah. Yeah, I realized um 
Christina's name was spelled Christ YNA, so in Christ time. And um, that taught us that, you know, just because doctors say hurry up and do it, you don't have a lot of time. It means it should be in Christ's time, not our time. Yeah, exactly. A lot. You hit and, that right um, on the head. So they they uh, they grew up together. The doctors were out of residency when I first started seeing a kidney doctor, and he recently retired. So he he has a soft spot for her and her sisters because he was through that journey as well. So he yeah, was, he drove right right with you. Isn't yeah. it nice to have a good nephrologist? Oh God, yes. I and mean, I, I can't think of it. Yeah, I I can't. <laughs> I go back and think about think about the guy I had to, that diagnosed me, and I still, after forty some years, I'm still, I'm still talking to him, and, and I get advice from him, and yeah, they're precious. They're absolutely a good one. I mean, you yeah. know, a good one uh, is worth his he salt. He always, um, he always met me in the emergency room when I'd come in. And it was my, amazing. Yep, mine was always wait. Call. Yep, yep. Or text nowadays. Text. Yeah, yeah, nowadays. Get get tired of doing that all the time. And okay, so what year did you have your transplant? And what this is going to be your anniversary next week. So how long have you how long have you had your transplant? Well, this is my second kidney transplant. Got it. It'll be three years on April third. But prior to that, I had one in two thousand six. Okay. I had what? to remove it in twenty eleven. What uh, what was the what was the cause reason for having to uh, that it failed? I guess um, I had CMV attack it, cytomegaly virus attack, it, and I okay. did everything with the rabbit thymoglobulin, and then I turned into a lobster, and I had to call in an emergency dermatologist to try to calm down my skin. And then you're, they, they you're very lucky. <laughs> I've had a lot of near death experiences. <laughs> As is quite common with kidney disease, right? Yeah, yeah. I'm lucky to be alive. Well, we, 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 if you never experienced it, you'll never know what it's like, right? I mean, it's that simple. You, know, you live yeah. with it all, and everybody, I understand that everybody's different. All kidney disease patients are different, but they have one thing in common that it's horrible to live with. Yeah, it is. And you have to, you have to, and really, people don't understand how much volatility there is trying to nope. stay with the disease. Because I still have my brother saying, Why don't you just get a whole body scan and get everything fixed and then you can live your life? And I'm like, That's not what disability is, that's not what the disease is. So, no, it takes its toll on you. I get, yeah. I, I, my heart goes out to these folks that have been on dialysis for so long. I mean, yeah, I was, you know, um. After the peritoneal, they found out it wasn't um, peritonitis. It was actually ovarian cysts were rupturing that was calling, causing the bloody discharge. So then they had to put me on hemodialysis the following year. And that was bad because my vein mapping showed I didn't have very strong veins or arteries. I always had to have the dialysis catheters in the neck. And then I had a very good vascular surgeon that put in a long-term antimicrobial type tunneled catheter that I had for 15 years. Wow. So how many year, total years were you on dialysis? All, 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 all. Um, all together, probably about 20 years. Off that, and on. Amazing. Amazing. Yeah. And when the first kidney failed and they removed it, I think I went from a woman's size 12 in clothing up to size um, 32W. So I was like the Goodyear blimp. I was really small. <laughs> what? And bib, the, bib the Michelin girl? Michelin, <laughs> yeah, I was a Michelin girl. I couldn't see. My face was swollen. Oh, my. It took about a year of three times a week dialysis to pull all that fluid off. I was very, very sick. How nauseated were you? And this sounds like a silly question, but how nauseated were you? That's Very nauseated because when I asked my kidney doctor in the beginning what this feels like when you go on dialysis, have to have dialysis or a transplant, he said it's like having the worst flu ever. And that's probably much how I can 
describe it because you don't eat, you, you're dizzy all the time. Um, can't sick, stand up, can't sit can't down. Can't stand up, can't lay down. You just want to crawl in a hole and wait till something stabilizes and then get up. Yep, I, I, I can, I can think back. I had two two times I had dialysis prior to transplant. I was pre a preemptive, and I can tell you the first after the first one, uh, I thought I was going to die. I actually did. I I really believed that I wasn't going to make it. I remember yeah. putting on the putting on the call light for the nurse and. She said, you'll be fine, you know, but. Oh, yeah. Um, if you got that. You'll be fine. Too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. They're like, just let us know if you feel weird. And I'm like, OK, what? What? Oh, my God. <laughs> I'll never forget that. Here you I'm, you know, th you're throwing up and you just ex exactly what you said. I can't I couldn't even see. I was just so sick. I had the world's worst headache. And then, and then she comes in and says, oh, yeah, you're, you're going to be okay. Don't worry. Everything will be fine. You'll be fine. And they'll thought, throw you backwards and yeah. say, have 20 people around you. You're fine. Yeah. <laughs> I, don't, I, I don't want this treatment ever again. It's so barbaric. Yeah. I really, I really felt the same way. I, I really – I want my transplant. I want to do this. I want to get it over with. Fortunately, I was healthy enough at, at the time. And and they got the, got the, my brother's kidney, but gee whiz, I yeah. I I just knew I didn't want to go anymore on dialysis. If I had to, I guess I would have. But I just said to myself, this is not going to happen. I and, looked at him and said, we can put a man on the moon. Why haven't we changed this therapy? Absolutely, great great statement. We yeah. we can pump all kinds of money left and right on everything, but why can't we come up with a better way of getting rid of fluid in your body and, yeah. and toxins? toxins but, yeah 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 so and i i ended up with c diff a couple of times from being in center yeah all it's not fun either no that's not and that you, your antibiotic load is tremendous that's all they seem to pump into you other than you know binders and stuff like that i guess they pump a lot of antibiotics too to suppress and then it. on top of that um i ended up needing a bone marrow biopsy because when the first transplant was removed um I became so anemic, I needed blood transfusions. And then I found out that I had MTHFR, which is a blood clotting disorder. So I'd clot off on the machine for dialysis. They have to keep giving me high amounts of heparin. <laughs> Were you also on steroids? Were steroids um, ever the in first, the picture? First kidney transplant, I was on steroids. And this one I was not, just only in the beginning for a okay. little bit. So they took you off. That's good because that's the trend now is to try to keep you off it unless you've been on it for long term. So that's yeah, interesting. I had a couple of uh, bone scans because of the steroid. Yeah. yeah. I've, been on, I've been on it for almost 40, 45 years. So you've been on steroids that long? Yep. Wow. Yep. I ended so, up doing home hemodialysis for four years before this second one. The second one, yeah. And I what? felt a lot better. I did four hours, seven days a week, or I got one day off. I could pick a day during that seven days to take off and not do dialysis, but it was a lot of work. And then I worked full time in a lab for clinical research. And everybody was amazed at that. And I said, <clears throat> we got to find better ways for kidney patients to live. This is not living on this dialysis. So your transplant, what, what year was your second one, did you say? It was in um, 2018. 2018. All right. So you're, you're in it. How's your kidney function? Has it been pretty good? Um, well, when I first got it, I started throwing up a lot. I couldn't keep anything down. And... Um, they thought CMV had already invaded it, which it did in, at four months old. So they had to keep adjusting drugs and stuff. And then they ended up um, having to do home care six months when it was six months old. And that was with phoscarnate and it causes a lot of heart palpitations. Palpitations, yep. And that was to kill the CMV, but um, I didn't know this, but I ended up with heart disease whether it's from the long-term dialysis or the two transplants or the phoscarnate, I blame the phoscarnate because it was 
close in time, but I get real dizzy when I was walking. Like if you were tired and you had to like, you still hadn't like recovered from sleep in the night before. Right, right. I got real drowsy, but you're pushing yourself. <clears throat> Found out my heart rate dropped in the low 30s. And um, my blood pressure could be 210 over 150, but my my heart rate would be really low. So that's and crazy. <laughs> pacemaker was put in last uh, March to keep it above 60. So that's been working very well. So I'm alive again. <laughs> yeah. And a smile on your face and a great attitude. I got to yeah. tell you, I it's it's a joy to talk to you because yeah. most people, they just rock along, you know, they don't, but you've gotten, you've gotten some, never you've had some God. wild turns in your <laughs> life, so to speak. Yeah. I never tell, will tell God I'm bored ever again because he has really kept me not bored with all this going on. <laughs> Yeah. What, what keeps you, what keeps you on the upside? A lot of people give up, right? Well, yeah. And that's why I tell people don't give up because tough times never last. Tough people do. So, you know, I always say that I'm optimistic that something around the corner is going to change. It's not going to be like this forever. Yeah. You just, you just think about the things that's happened to you. But then they're in the past. They're in the, you know, you, you've got to move on, right? You've got to right. just, you've got to be, be in the present. Yeah, live and learn and be in the present. Yeah, and focus and just, you know, get in, stay in your lane and go. Don't, right. don't look back. Looking back is just not, not in the cards. It's just too difficult. And uh, yeah, there's just, plenty of times I didn't think I'd see my 30s, my 40s. Now I'm in my 50s. Yeah. Celebrate every year because. I have to be able to live. And people are like, well, if there's no hope, why do you even do the transplant? Like why even do dialysis or do the transplant? And I'm like, because somebody needs you in their, in their life. But it's not always about nobody. You. Me. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You, you're an impact on everybody else's life. And when you're not here, they fall apart. So they need you. Well, if you, if you don't have any hope, that's on you because hope is, it's internal. It's eternal and internal. You yeah. have to have, you have to have hope. If you don't, then you have to take what's coming, you know, because right. you know, in kidney disease, there's not much left after you've done transplant dialysis and, right. and you have to make some end of life decisions, but that's not a focus that you have to endure at all. It's something you can plan for. And you just live every day like it's right. there's no tomorrow, right? I had a lot of um, chair patients, you know, in my center, chair neighbors that would give up because their copay was as much as their mortgage or they were the breadwinner in the family. And they felt like <clears throat> they weren't contributing to society without a paycheck. And I said, you, you're not you're not a person of a paycheck. You're a person no. of other things. So I I've. I used my journey to go to Congress and I've gone for several years now with my dialysis machine when I was doing home hemo with next stage and with my transplant. And I said, if I can stand upright, walk, I'm going to go talk to Congress because people need help. And we've been working on some caregiving legislation and try to get that started through the Ohio Um legislation and um, hopefully it'd be federal because I was lucky I had a daughter that could help take care of me growing up, but not a lot of people have that. No, many, very few even have a mentor, somebody that they could call and right. talk to. Uh, that That is a very great point because, you know, there's got to be a, a, some degree of happiness in what you're doing. You You know that that's what you're here for. That's Something right. you're fulfilling in your in a need basis for you. Uh, All right. It's great. I'm happy to hear that. Do yeah, you... so I work I worked on a, <clears throat> a lot of the legislation that passed with the anti-rejection drugs being covered for the life of the kidney or the life of the transplant. Yes. Um, yes. Increasing transplantation and with the executive order that president prior president Trump passed. And you know, I've been working on a lot of these things that are coming to flourishion. And um, I've also worked with the FDA when I was working with Dr. Roy and Dr. Sh um, Gura with their artificial kidneys. Kidneys? Okay. 
Yeah, so I've worked with them a couple of times and told them what patients need and what they can what they can handle. So those are coming much better, faster than I expected. So that's good. Now that's that's where you wanted to find hope. That you know, yeah. you talked just talked about that. But people give up, they have no hope. Yeah. But there's self-induced hope too. You, you get yourself busy doing what needs to be done. Forget about yourself and start worrying about taking care others. of others. That's what I tell a lot of my support <clears throat> groups on Facebook. A lot of people are like, you're never going to get take down a billion dollar company like, you know, dialysis centers. And I'm like, dialysis is not the answer. I mean, we may need not. it intermittently or, you know, so for some um, comorbidities and patients, but it's not the, it's supposed to be the status quo because that's not living. We have to find better ways and they all keep, you know, the naysayers for this new upcoming um, research that's showing that it's working. So thank God for clinical research. We're getting it. Uh, thanks. Thank goodness for the dollars that are now being spent on it. We've been, yeah, you know, kidney world has been true. so strapped for cash. Uh, I think it was like $19 per person per year. Yeah. Whereas things like AIDS and HIV and all those were up around 13 hundred dollars you know yeah the heart disease gets heart, it the cancer yeah. gets it kidney is always last but kidney is whole body yeah and it and it affects all the others okay when yeah they, when they go the rest of it goes so you know yeah. i i think that advocacy is not only important but it's it's almost needed by people like you and i we have to tell people about what we've gone through and how yes. difficult it is, and not not for pity or you know self pity, but just to let them know that this is not fun. It's not no. fun at all. And fact, don't think that this is how the life's going to be because you know things are going to change around the corner. Yep, yep. They don't right. look around the corner, and I think with our recent pandemic, it's taught a lot of if there is such a thing a normal person that had their normal life uprooted. That's kind of like a paradigm that they can relate to how we live sometimes because we try to live you know to the fullest and we try to provide for our families and try to work and try to advocate advocacy and everything and then our bodies shut down we're back in the hospital for something that we didn't think we would have to be facing some people will go home and sit down other people will get up and progress and and no matter how how sick you are, no matter what kind of disease process you have, standing upright and moving on is, is what I think is expected of you. And that's and what I tell true. all these naysayers. I'm like, we need your voices. We need your stories. You know, please join all these organizations and quit sitting there and saying, woe is me. And it's a billion dollar industry and nobody can crack it. Well, if Medicare is not going to pay for it, Guarantee there's going to be a crack in the system. Something, something got to back up. Yeah. Yep. Right. We could go. We could go off on that that bunny trail real quick because yeah. it is changing. Uh, we, yeah. You know, like I'm you glad. said, di dialysis is. You know, it's not a cure. Well, neither is transplant. So we need to find out what's causing FSGS. We need to find out what. We've been doing that for years, fifty years almost in research of ours. Yeah. And well, and you know, yeah. People don't. People think the transplant is a piece of cake, and it isn't. Not. not. I find a lot of people that get a transplant that hasn't had the the experience with dialysis doesn't really appreciate all the side effects or step backs with a transplant. Yeah, the, it's a treatment form. It's not a cure. No, but it's like the best thing. I, it, for me, it it's was the best things. thing. Yeah, the yeah, best thing I better. ever had. Yep. Yep. But you, like I said, different strokes for different folks and right. bless them. If you're on dialysis, yeah. how could you say no to helping somebody on dialysis? How could you say no? They need a transplant or want a transplant. You should go to every length. And, uh, and that's what that's what my heart is set on is helping anybody. Can't turn anybody away. Yeah, uh, because I don't want them sitting there with this disease thinking they have no other options. Absolutely. And I think it's up to, to the medical. Hope. Yep. I think it's up to the medical community to make sure that information gets out. Yeah. Not, not, not from the right. patients, but actually from the medical community. 
They're the right. ones that provide the hope. Yeah. Right? So my um, current transplant that's coming up on the anniversary of April 3rd, it, it was a considered organ to be thrown away. Uh huh. Okay. It was a discard, going to be a discarded organ. Yeah. yeah. So I took it anyway because my neck veins are getting, were getting very bad. I didn't have anything in my legs for an access. And now I have um, the subclavian keeps collapsing, causing um, swelling in my right arm. Yeah. And lymphedema and type stuff. With, um, yeah. Blood clots in my jugular and my subclavian. So I just roll with the punches, but, um, you know, I'm alive. I'm on, you know, blood thinners, but I make sure that if I have a voice and I can still comprehend, I'm going to be writing my Congress representatives. I'm going to be participating and helping because the people need that. And I they don't, them, they don't know, do they? In all they, honesty, don't know, they, they don't they know, know a lot. Even when I went to different conferences with the kidney communities, and I bring back all this information, I'd go to my dialysis centers that I was a patient and say, I want to give this to my fellow dialysis patients. And they say, oh, no, we're not going to allow that information in here. Yeah, yeah. I don't agree either. So I try to get them out, the, get out, look up and find this. And we've been making a lot of changes in the past five years that's really been interesting. And they're all sitting getting told, oh, that's not going to happen for another 10 years or that's not going to ever happen for another 50. Could oh. happen next week. Yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. And it, when you look at things now from where you at, Tony, from where you're yeah. sitting right now today, what is what is your hope? What What is it that you hope for the most and pray for? What is that? Um, to find a cure for kidney disease. And I was in a in a talk yesterday. I was in in a, a form panel, and everybody to a T. They were all some something to do with kidney disease, either rare wow. kidney disease or diabetes or whatever that they or they had kidney failure, and not either it had a transplant. Well, the, the first question out of the box was, okay, what is it that you would like to see happen on the grand scale of everything? You know, right. thinking out of the box, whatever. And to the T, it was find a cure. Yeah. And I'll be honest with you, I've been asking for that since 1984. Wow. Okay, so prayers that, that, that you need to ask for this is are very important. But the most thing that you said, and it's very important, is there's always hope. Yes. That's what that's what Jesus provides is hope. And that's mm -hmm. and exactly what you're you're preaching to us about. Yeah, you have to have that baseline or you can't face a lot of this, you know. No. I'll be no. in your ear, give up, and we don't want you to give up. We Absolutely. Want if anybody's listening out here working. now, that's right. Don't don't give up. If you have to give up, then get some help. If yes. you're thinking about giving up, get some yeah, help. My first my first encounter with my nephrologist that was just out of residency. He was like, you need to be on an antidepressant medicine. I'm like, oh, I'm 18. I'm not depressed. I'm enjoying life except for this new little thing that's over here bothering me, you know? Yeah. And he's like, no, no, you know, it's very depressing, this disease. And I didn't believe him, but I do now from everything I've been through. Sure. Because the experience teaches you. Yeah. It shows you where you've been and it won't let you know where you're going. So it's up to you. To yeah, say you have to follow the light. In that's your life, right. That's in your right. Heart, in your spirit. That's and right. If, you got to have a solid foundation to fall back on. There was many times I felt like <clears throat> I was sleeping through life. I wasn't <laughs> existing. Know, existing. I was like, oh, well, it's dark again, and I'm just now getting up after a treatment and going to eat and go back to bed. It's like, and I'm like, this is what you need right now. Your body needs to heal, and you don't need to worry about anything else. And it God will take care of it. There's a, there's a uh, a feeling I guess I got was there's it was of anticipation. I didn't think any of this moved fast for me. Do you know what I'm yeah. saying? Do you, you, nothing in this kidney world, nothing seems to move fast. 
Uh, yeah. It's okay. Don't worry. We'll watch it. You know, th- you know, that's kind of the attitude. And, and that's been an attitude that I've really tried not to ha- get into. I want to move on. I want to move. I don't want to, I don't want to have to wait and see. Waiting and right. seeing, waiting's not in my vocabulary. Okay. It's not. Right. And I hope that people are listening. They'll accept the fact that waiting is not what you want to do. You may be told about it. You may think that they want you to do that, but it doesn't have to be. Get out and find out about it. Yeah, that's what I would. Some of our information would be on like local TV channels because a lot of the dialysis patients in center would watch TV. Yeah. Wouldn't get information because some of them aren't tech savvy or don't know Google or what's out there. And when I first started dialysis and on my journey, I was like, there's got to be something more. There's got to be some other avenue of what needs to be changed. And I would get in this mindset at the clinic that I'm sorry, there is nothing else, you know? And I'm like, no, there's got, you got to keep searching for better solutions. You can't find it. You make it. Yeah. You just really, and and that's what advocacy does. It makes things move. It makes, makes things right for you. And then you you have a good feeling inside that you're doing something. So with with my history, excuse me, when I had my daughter, I made sure when she was still in utero that the ultrasound would check her kidneys and check for reflux. And then at different milestones in her life, I would take her back to the pediatrician and want her kidneys evaluated either with blood or ultrasound or something because I was very proactive in that. And she was never, she never had the disease, which is very, very thankful and encouraging. But I've also, you know, my, my experiences being young was always a bladder infection or kidney infection. And they would say, quit drinking soda pop or Coca-Cola and then quit putting you in, you know, bubble baths at 10 years, nine, eight, 10 years old. And then I'm finding out that wouldn't have done anything. And that's what I'm hoping that executive order is to get pediatricians and primary care physicians to check for kidney disease. Because like um, what I've learned in my own experience and others is they don't find out they have kidney disease until they're throwing up and they're in the emergency room and then life. I always say that the the most simplest test that you can do for kidney disease is a urinalysis. That's a five dollar test that will, in the majority of cases, show protein in your urine. There should never be protein in your urine. There's no reason for it to be there. So consequently, instead of waiting to see what it is, it should be aggressively managed right off the get go. So there you go. And then. Trying to trying to get the screens when my daughter was in school to get the health um, teacher to to touch on kidney disease and you know if the kids feel sick or something to tell their parents and I was turned down because the health teacher is like if we focus on one disease we got to focus on them all <laughs> yeah it doesn't fit that profile and I'm like yeah. even strep throat a lot of sure. kids strep throat causes the kidneys to have damage to it. And then there's always the minimal change there that's there that's there right off the get go, and it, it advances at a very very young age until yeah. they're so sick that they, uh, and that could easily be picked up, right? In a screening, absolutely. And I see a lot of miscommunication on all fronts, and I'm you know I've worked in the hospital. I'm like this whole healthcare system needs to be uprooted and flipped. I mean. A lot of things are not, needs a lot of work. Yeah. And it's not continuity of care and there's not a lot of communication. People need to learn and they don't because nobody's telling them. And let's think of all the people that don't make it to the hospital that are out there. True. Yeah. <laughs> that are walking scary. around with, what is it? I estimated 30 million walking around with kidney disease and don't even know they have it. Have it. Yeah. And then I've tried to educate my family and they're like, well, if you can still pee, you're fine. If you can still no, no, that's pee, not you're true. You're fine, and I'm like, you don't understand. That is not true. No, no. Okay, let me ask you one question before we go, because it's okay. time to to work our way out of this. And let me tell you, I really appreciate you. I'm oh, gonna, thank I'm you. I'm going to stay in touch with you. Yeah, I appreciate it. <laughs> thank uh, you. 
Have you been vaccinated? Have you gotten the vaccination immunization for COVID? Yeah. No, the doctors told me no. Okay. That, enough said. Just want to know. I ask everybody that. I, I want to know. So, well, with my um, <coughs> second Excuse transplant me. not working well and has, it has a um, trans, I think it's called transplant glomerulonephritis. Yes. So fill in a lot of urine uh, protein, even with this kidney. They don't want to mess up the immune system. And then also because I have severe allergies. So I used to not have a lot of allergies until I started dialysis. So I'm allergic to tetanus. I'm highly allergic to antibiotics. So I think. They just, no, your decision is fine. Yeah. It's acceptable. I mean, your some physician. people don't accept it and I no. have to explain it. So that's why I was kind of giving you the background. Absolutely. Because it, it is it between you and your physician and you're the ultimate person to decide what's going to happen. Well, I All like right? that statement, Kent. I wish some of our ads would say that. Yep. There's you, uh, you are, you and your you're doctor. The, that's right. It's you and your doctor. And then you get to make the decision. He gives you options. Right. And I feel that that's the reason I've done as well as I have, because I've continued with my physician, my right. nephrologist, they've given me the options that I've chosen. They right. recommend it. Why go if you're not going to, you know, heed their advice. So right. no, if you, I just ask everybody if they've been immunized, Okay, it's up to you. It's up to you to make the decision. No one can right. argue that. There's no reason to argue it at all. None, yeah. not even debate it. So patients need that. They need to trust their doctor. Yeah. And their themselves, doctor. they need to trust themselves. Trust themselves, their gut. Yeah. Yeah. Because a they, lot of them do not. no, and a lot of them just willy nilly go on and that, you know, that's fine because they, they need more education, everybody. But the whole point here is that you, Tony Martin, has a good relationship with her doctors and she follows instructions, but she's the one that makes the decision. And that's the same way my life is too. AAKP, or the American Association of Kidney Patients, is the oldest and largest independent kidney patient organization in the United States is dedicated to improving the lives and long-term outcomes of kidney patients through education, advocacy, patient engagement, and the fostering of patient communities. AAKP fights for early disease detection and the appropriate diagnosis of rare genetic conditions, increased kidney transplantation, and preemptive transplantation. Full patient choice of either in-center or home dialysis protection of the patient-physician relationship, promotion of research and innovation, including artificial, implantable, and wearable kidneys, and the elimination of barriers for patient access to available treatment options. To join, go to aakp.org. I think we'll leave it there. How's that, that sound to you? That sounds good. All right. like a great ending. <laughs> Okay, listen, stick around for just a second. I'm going to talk okay. to, to my folks, and, and I want to just talk with you just a little bit more. Uh, okay. okay, for anybody who's listening, remember, you can, uh, you can get a hold of me at uh, kidneysolutions.org, or my phone number's spread out through everything. If you have a question about uh, the disease process, the kidney disease process, the transplant process, if we don't have an answer at Kidney Solutions, we surely can find it and we'll help you with it. And everything that we provide through Kidney Solutions, remember, please remember, is uh, it's free. We don't charge. We have no fees. You'll never get a bill from Kidney Solutions. So if you got kidney disease, if you're new, old, in the middle, check out kidneysolutions.org. Until then, keep breathing. <music>